Good morning, everyone. We're just going to give just another minute or two for some of our audience members to join us. Okay, let's get started. Uh, good morning again. My name is Monica Staff and I'm the attorney for the Rhode Island Association of Realtors and Statewide MLS. And I will be your moderator this morning. So welcome to our program. Uh, we've, got some, we've got an action packed program. And so I'm just gonna give a few logistical announcements. So you're probably used to the drill by now, but if not, this is gonna be a Zoom webinar so the only people you're gonna be able to see on here are us as panelists. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask of the panelists, um, you should see at, at least on my computer, it's at the bottom of my screen, you'll see a Q&A button and you can actually type your questions into there while the panelists are speaking. We're gonna hold all the questions to the end of the presentation just to give everyone a chance. We've got a lot of really great material for you. Uh, okay, so why don't I do this? You'll hear from me occasionally throughout the program, but let me turn things over to Leanne DeTorey, and who is the president of the Rhode Island Association of Realtors. And so she will give us a welcome. Leanne, take it Hi. away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Monica, for the introduction. And good morning. Welcome to our forum, Lending Trends in a Red Hot, Real in a Red Hot Market with the Rhode Island Association of Realtors and the Rhode Island Mortgage Bankers Association. I am so happy to be here today uh, to be part of this because it really is such an important and useful topic with the way the market is right now. Um, I am your 2021 president, as Monica mentioned, of the Rhode Island Association of Realtors. And I'm joined today with another president, president of the Rhode Island Mortgage Bankers Association, Al Grant, who's here with us as well. And the Rhode Island Association of Realtors is pleased to be working with the Rhode Island Mortgage Bankers Association on legislative business and education. Now, I mentioned earlier that this is a particularly important topic in today's market and the type of market that we are facing. It is very unique in a sense that it's such a strong seller's market to the point where the Rhode Island Association of Realtors has never seen supply this low and demand this high since we have been tracking data. So that's right, statistically, uh, we have really never seen numbers like this and uh, we, we beat all kinds of records this year in particular. So this strong seller's market has forced buyer agents to really get creative and very strategic when working with buyers to give them a great chance at home ownership amongst lots of other competitive buyers. One of the most important ways to prepare when working with buyers in this market, if not the most important part of the process, is working with the right mortgage broker. So having a very communicative mortgage broker is so important since you'll possibly be frequently needing updated pre-approval letters, since negotiations happen really fast and under highest and best time constraints, sometimes taking place on weekends, outside of business hours. If you've been working in this market, you know exactly what I'm referring to. So have you and your buyers chosen the right lender that will be available to update documentation for you when needed under fast time frames? under fast negotiations. And uh, often, I'm sure you all have seen that, you know, in multiple offer scenarios, the sellers are sometimes looking beyond the offer prices when all of the offers are relatively close and they start to really look at the terms of the offer. And a lot of times that has to do with, with lending. So have your buyers worked closely with the right lender that has positioned mm -hmm. them to present their strongest terms to put them in the strongest buying position if it came down to it? These are all super important factors, questions, and scenarios that we are facing, and it all comes down to choosing the right lender early on in the process. This is why we are thrilled today to have the whole group over there from, Rhode Island, from the Rhode Island Mortgage Bankers Association, <clears throat> and we're thrilled to have Al Grant with us today to give us some insight on these trends and everything that we might love to see from a lender standpoint that will ultimately allow us as professionals to have the best knowledge and expertise when representing our clients in this very unique market. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Al Grant uh, to, to further elaborate on this. So go ahead, Al. 
Thank you, Leanne. And thank you, Phil, David, Monica, the entire membership of RIAR for having us here this morning. I really believe there's a powerful symbiotic relationship between our two organizations, and I really love the uh, growing collaboration. Thank you, Leanne and Phil, for making that a, a reality. Working together, we have a tremendously positive impact on Rhode Islanders and the promotion of responsible home ownership. And besides that, is there anywhere you'd rather be on a Wednesday morning before a holiday weekend than here talking mortgages? And please mute yourself before you answer that. <coughs> uh, thank you very much for having us. I do think this is a worthwhile conversation and we're gonna talk in some detail this morning about some uh, common areas legislatively that I think our two groups are, are, are tackling, and then just some of the common uh, lending issues uh, that we're dealing with uh, in, as Leanne described it, and it's not hyperbole anymore, uh, a red hot market, something that uh, uh, even, even old white haired guys like me haven't really been involved in anything like this before. So uh, again, thanks for having me. Thanks for having uh, Rimba and the rest of our crew. And uh, I look forward to a great uh, conversation this morning. Thanks so much, Al, Al and Leanne. Um, and Al, Al, the person that Al was thanking is our own Phil Tedesco, the CEO of the Rhode Island Association of Realtors. These two have been putting their heads together for a while thinking, what can we do together? So if there are any RIMBA members in the audience, we welcome you. And we, of course, welcome members of the Realtor Association. So let me just tell you what else is coming up. Um, we'll first have David Salvatore, and who's the Government Affairs Director for the Realtor Association, and James Hahn, Attorney James Hahn, who fills a similar role for the Rhode Island Mortgage Bankers Association, will give us a legislative update. And then we're gonna have some of those burning questions answered that you might have had and not had a chance to ask um, mortgage brokers who you work with. Uh, we will have Al again. We will have Rhonda Mulligan and Jane Furlong, who are very experienced mortgage brokers, and they've got a lot of initials and designations after their names. So pay close attention. And in the meantime, what I will do is I will post the um, video link in the chat that you'll be able to access next week, because even though Al is being very modest about mortgages before holiday weekend, we're sure you'll wanna watch this video over and over again. So you will have that link and the ability to do so. So let's start with David. And David, what's going on with legislation from the Realtor perspective? And then we'll move on to Jim. And oh, and David, before you, sorry, I cut you off before you even opened your mouth. How about that? Um, Jim, um, our other panelist, Jim Hahn has been having some issues with his computer connection. So you may just hear his voice rather than seeing him, but he is here. Okay, David, I'm done talking. Off to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Monica, and thank you to the teams at, uh, at Raya or RIMBA. Uh, personally speaking, I've always enjoyed a wonderful relationship with, uh, with RIMBA. Uh, we've worked side by side now for uh, every year uh, that I've been the government affairs director at Raya. So that's been six years of advocacy on behalf of Raya. So again, uh, thank you to both teams for all of your efforts in, in making the legislative sessions, I won't say easy, uh, but enjoyable uh, to work through uh, most of the time. So again, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining this, uh, this forum. It's, uh, again, it, it's great to bring the two industries together to discuss issues in a collaborative manner and, and trying to move uh, from through the legislative lens, uh, bills forward, uh, or opposing bills uh, that impact both of our industries. Uh, and I think I can speak for Jim uh, when I say it has been an interesting legislative session thus far. In my six years of advocacy for IR, I have never experienced uh, a legislative session where, frankly, uh, state leaders are, I don't want to say more concerned, but are taking into consideration the number of people testifying and or submitting written statements of support or opposition for legislation, and at times uh, not considering data and, and subject matter expertise. And I get the politics behind it. Uh, it. It's not only happening here in Rhode Island, but it's happening across the country. Uh, but we remain committed to, to being the, the, the go-to shop for organized real estate. 
and building relationships with legislators uh, that we have uh, cultivated over the years in working with new legislators on why housing uh, is important to our entire state. So we'll continue to provide data and research and leveraging national resources to advance our legislative agenda in collaboration with, uh, with the mortgage bankers. There have been thousands of bills uh, introduced this legislative session. In fact, we're, uh, we're tracking over 170 bills uh, just at RIAR related to real estate and measures that, uh, that are impacting the business community. Uh, we are happy to know that Speaker Shikarchi is, is taking the lead on housing matters. Uh, early in the session, Rayar participated in a press conference with the Speaker uh, where he introduced seven bills related to housing. Uh, one of those bills, which would make it easier for property owners uh, to construct what are called tiny homes uh, on their properties, uh, was introduced on our behalf. Uh, another bill uh, that would establish a commission to study all aspects of housing, uh, um, land use in Rhode Island uh, is, is paramount, I think, to that holistic approach that we're looking for uh, to address the shortage in housing across our state. That land use study has not uh, been conducted in Rhode Island in decades, so that is long overdue. And on the low to moderate income side, uh, of the housing conversation, you know, we continue to have conversations and look forward to participating once again in a commission that will look at uh, avenues to construct more affordable housing and how those, how those units are counted in the state. As many of you know, uh, there is a state mandate that every municipality uh, deem 10% of their housing stock as affordable under the state's definition of affordable housing. Uh, we as, as a trade association participated uh, in that commission several years ago. We're looking forward to that, uh, uh, that commission uh, commencing again in the coming weeks uh, as, a, uh, as a member. And speaking of affordable housing, uh, many of you, if not all of you know that, that there are many leaders in the state house who are looking to create what's called a, a dedicated revenue stream to fund low to moderate income housing throughout the state. Uh, RIAR has supported this concept now for the last several uh, legislative sessions. Uh, we, again, uh, like to take a holistic approach at housing, and on the low to moderate, en uh, low to moderate income uh, spectrum, we know that it's important for tenants to have safe and sustainable housing so that they can uh, aspire to be homeowners one day. Uh, but we are concerned uh, that the governor and the General Assembly are uh, at times only interested in taking what I think is, is the easy route, and that's increasing the, the real estate conveyance tax by 100% on certain homes sold uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, so we'll continue working with the General Assembly on the holistic approach to addressing housing that we're looking for. Uh, I, I'm confident that they, they would agree uh, and I know that Speaker Shikarchi agrees that we do have to take a holistic approach and, uh, and not only throw more money at the problem, but we do have to look at land use and zoning uh, as avenues to construct more housing on, uh, on all levels. So we have, as a trade association, a pretty robust legislative uh, agenda this session. Uh, we have introduced or asked the General Assembly to introduce seven bills on our behalf. And they range from fair housing, which is uh, near and dear to us, something that we recognize that we have to do a better job of not only promoting, but adhering to as, uh, as real estate agents and brokers. Uh, and also, again, creating more opportunities for folks to be um, home buyers. Uh, last night, I testified on a bill that was introduced on our behalf uh, in the House Finance Committee that would provide for uh, the creation of what are called first-time homebuyer savings accounts. Uh, and this, this concept is starting to pick up steam across the country. There are at least 12 or 13 states who have already adopted legislation allowing for uh, these uh, tax incentivized uh, savings accounts. Uh, and there are more states, state legislatures that have introduced uh, this measure during uh, the current legislative session. So this would provide for a tax incentive for people to save money for that first, uh, first home purchase while providing for a state income tax credit. Uh, we think it's extremely important that 
uh, we're providing tools and resources uh, for prospective home buyers by incentivizing them to put money away to save for that first home. And for those folks who would question, you know, what is in this for the state? Why are we incentivizing people to buy homes? Well, there is a return on that investment for, for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, as you know, uh, every time a piece of real estate is sold in Rhode Island, uh, the state imposes and collects what's called a, uh, a real estate transfer tax. Uh, and, and by the way, the more homeowners uh, we have in Rhode Island, uh, the more opportunities there are for people to increase their income at the same time. So now they're, uh, they're generating personal wealth uh, and they're participating in the American dream. And, and you know, going back to the fair housing comment that I made earlier, we recognize that we have to do a better job of uh, promoting home ownership for everybody. Uh, I think when you look at Rhode Island, our home ownership rate lags uh, when compared to the rest of the country. But if you look at uh, minority home ownership, non-Latino white Rhode Islanders, uh, they not only lag, but it's, it's unfortunate that there aren't more home buying opportunities uh, for minorities in Rhode Island. So we think, you know, uh, tools like the First Time Home Buyer Savings Account Act uh, could certainly play a role in increasing home ownership opportunities. And then we'll continue uh, looking to reduce costs for, for homeowners. We've introduced a, a bill that has passed through the House and the Senate uh, this legislative session around uh, condo resale certificates. Uh, this bill would cap the amount that a condo association can, uh, can charge for one of these certificates at $125. This is modeled after uh, a piece of legislation that was introduced in Connecticut. Uh, and I believe Pennsylvania also caps their resale certificate at $125 as well. Uh, and as you know, there are many times when these small costs are passed on blindly to, uh, to the home buyer. Uh, so we're trying to mitigate that through bills uh, like the condo resale certificate uh, cap. And then we're, uh, we're looking at some local legislation as well uh, that prohibits municipalities from spot assessing uh, real estate or homes uh, at the time of title transfer. There was an issue in the town of Barrington most recently where the tax assessor unilaterally, without even going through the council, uh, decided that he was going to reassess property at the time of uh, at the time of title transfer. And you know, when that new homeowner received their first tax bill, there was not only sticker shock, but there was a lot of anger. Uh, and I think from the the lending perspective, uh, there are folks who were were asking, well, how can somebody afford the mortgage? That, um, that, they, that they agreed to when their taxes are already being increased at the time of title transfer. And then finally, uh, we are tracking a, a slew of uh, landlord tenant bills uh, that have been introduced in the General Assembly this year. There's been a lot of talk about the, uh, the eviction moratorium, uh, both at the national level and the state level. Uh, the CDC's uh, executive order, as you know, uh, was ruled, I don't think it was unconstitutional, but far reaching by the courts. Uh, and now you, there's increased pressure on the states to pass what are called statewide statutes around imposing uh, the eviction moratorium. So we'll continue having conversations with the General Assembly on why uh, this is bad policy, uh, not only for homeowners, but for tenants as well. Uh, and there are about four or five other landlord tenant bills that uh, we're not only tracking, but we're taking active positions on, uh, such as requiring a landlord prior to um, a lease agreement, uh, signing a lease agreement to deliver a valid certificate of suitability. It's just, that's not, it's not feasible. It's just not because there just aren't enough inspectors in Rhode Island to take on that work. And by the way, that's a function of municipal government. Um, and then finally, uh, that there are a couple of bills related to the pandemic uh, that we're not only tracking, but again, taking active positions on uh, one uh, relative to the federal pay paycheck protection program uh, in exempting taxation from any loan forgiveness at the state level. Uh, and an uh, another bill related to the pande pandemic, something that we work closely with uh, Nelly Gorbea on was allowing the continuance of remote online notarization. This is important, I believe, we believe, to, to both uh, trade associations and expediting and, and streamlining the, the closing process. 
So again, there, there's a lot of activity happening at the General Assembly. Uh, it's now May 26th. Uh, the next month is going to be very busy, I think, in terms of uh, getting bills pushed through uh, the legislative process and again, uh, advocating uh, in opposition uh, to those bills that adversely impact real estate here in Rhode Island. So happy to answer any questions. I know I've said a lot. Uh, I'm sure Jim has a lot to add as well, but uh, if there are any other uh, questions or comments you have, obviously put them in the chat, but uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, through a telephone call or email. Uh, David, thanks so much for that update. You're welcome. Excellent. And just as a reminder to everyone who's listening, you can post questions in the Q&A for any of our panelists. Um, it looks like I know that our panelist, Jim Hahn, had mentioned he had computer issues before. So it looks like he has dropped off. I think what we'll do is- I'm, 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 Monica, I'm back. Oh, you're back. Only you're listed as Al Grant. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm Let using see. Al's uh, um, login. Let so. me see if I can rename you here. Okay. Okay, Jim, that was perfect timing. So before before you, um, I'm I'm having I guess I'm cutting off every everybody before you get in your first word. But I realized I really scrimped on your introduction before. For anyone who doesn't know Jim Hahn, he is also a senior partner at Partridge Snow and Hahn, and he is on and uh, he's also the outside counsel for the Rhode Island Association of Realtors. So we really do have more overlap than you might think. So Jim, go right ahead. What, what would you like to tell us in terms of a legislative update? So um, I would uh, echo um, David's comments uh, in terms of the unusual nature of this year's uh, legislative session and the difficulty that um, our uh, advocates at the General Assembly have had because there is no opportunity for informal discussion with uh, legislators. Everything is formally done on Zoom and uh, a lot of the informal discussion where um, it, information can be gleaned about what the real essence of a bill is and why someone is pushing it and how you can work around it um, to be able to meet both sides uh, needs is just much more difficult um, with the, uh, uh, the remote uh, access. Um, we had been following, David and I um, converse about bills, and we have been following a number of the bills that uh, RIAR is opposing, um, the conveyance tax bill and the moratorium bills, uh, all related to mortgage payments and re real estate uh, rentals, um, are of concern to us because of the potential impact uh, on uh, the ability to sell mortgages in the secondary market to the extent that those pieces of legislation get Rhode Island out of the mainstream, the risk occurs that uh, the people who package mortgages and sell them in the secondary market will become skittish and that we'll have a difficult time um, selling those loans. And if you can't sell those loans, the types of loans that become available are only variable rate or portfolio loans for lenders who are in the Rhode Island market. So from a legislative standpoint, one of the things that RIMBA is really focused on always are things that would make us an outlier uh, and increase risk of unsaleability of loans. Um, so it, we've been following um, many of the same bills that David mentioned. I won't repeat those. I will mention a couple that are of very significant interest to RIMBA and its members. Um, one, which is uh, an opportunity for us to actually support legislation, is a banking law cleanup bill that uh, the Department of Business Regulation introduced. We had some concerns about certain provisions in it, which we were able to discuss with DBR. But most important, we were able to persuade DBR to include in the bill amendments to the licensing laws, which will enable, if enacted, will enable our mortgage loan originators to continue working remotely. Um, previously, under the, the way the statute worked, um, having uh, loan originators working from home uh, was 
uh, a potential violation of the licensing laws. And uh, particularly if, if uh, any kind of uh, work with consumers was done from those locations, um, it was a problem. And we've been able, um, using a template that the Mortgage Bankers Association of America came up with to um, propose legislation that will uh, enable um, loan originators to continue working remotely, provided that they're appropriately supervised and there are uh, appropriate safeguards for um, security of electronic communication. Um, and we are hopeful that that bill will get passed. Um, another one that we have been working uh, very hard to oppose is a bill that's been pushed by the uh, Attorney General for the last several years. Um, and that is an amendment to the Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act uh, in Rhode Island. Um, under the current version of that law, um, there is an exemption for regulated industries. Um, and unfortunately, um, or, or maybe fortunately, depending on what side of the argument you are on, um, the Rhode Island courts um, decided some time ago that regulated industries as used in that statute applied to anyone who had a license. So that runs the gamut from a, a bank or a mortgage banking company, which not only are licensed, but they have to go through training and they are examined on an annual basis and they pay the cost of that examination. Um, so they are subject to a whole range of regulation and regulatory control down to a hairdresser. And a hairdresser simply gets pays $25 and gets a license to be a hairdresser. And that, um, the, unfortunately, the courts have determined exempts them from the Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act. What the agenda, Attorney General has proposed is eliminating that exemption um, unless you are expressly um, acting pursuant to a regulation, which really is kind of a distinction without a difference in our mind, but adds in a $10,000 penalty per violation. And for somebody in the lending industry, if we violate a law once, we're going to violate it a lot because it, we use the same procedure for every loan. And um, as a result, what we are really concerned about with this bill is it gives the attorney general the opportunity to um, use a $10,000 penalty multiplied by, you know, 200 violations to extract um, a settlement or a change without the benefit of judicial decision making because the potential risk to the violator uh, will be too great to fight. And we just think it changes the balance of power um, and it really shifts from a kind of regulation where the regulation is proposed in advance. Um, everybody has the opportunity to discuss it. It's finalized. You now know this is what conduct is, is prohibited and you conform your behavior to that regulation. This allows for regulation by enforcement. We don't like what you're doing. So we're going to come with a club and make you cease what you're doing or run the risk of a huge penalty. And it's not the way we think as a matter of policy that regulation should occur. So it's something that we've been um, very much opposed to. Uh, unfortunately, it's something the attorney general would like to see pushed uh, and, and is pushing for. Um, and uh, where that's gonna play out, we, it's not clear, um, but it's, it's something that's a real concern to our industry. Um, and then uh, the other concern to, for, for us, um, and, and I, David, if I'm repeating what you said, I dropped off for about four minutes, but there are a number of bills in the General Assembly that are directed toward changes in the Rhode Island income tax. And uh, a particular concern to us is uh, the fact that they would, depending upon the bill, either increase the maximum rate paid um, for 
higher earning taxpayers and higher earning varies by bill from 400,000 to potentially 500,000. And the rate change would go from 5.99% to 6.99% or 8.99%. Um, when that rate was established um, probably about eight years ago at this point, it was the result of real negotiation and the give back of certain deductions that high income uh, taxpayers had. And it was revenue neutral to the state. And it was really an effort to get that high rate down so that optically we were not different than our neighbors. Um, any, uh, any change in that bill adversely affects those optics to the detriment of the economy of Rhode Island. But more importantly, from our standpoint, most of our members who are not banks are organized as pass-through entities, either limited liability companies or S corporations. And I'm sure for realtors, that is true as well. And the income that the company earns passes through to the owners um, on K-1s and is taxed to them at, um, uh, at, as individuals. So when you layer on the income of the business on top of the income of the individual, you're really just taxing the business and increasing um, or, or, or diminishing the ability of the business to accumulate cash for reinvestment. So those bills are of particular concern to us. And then lastly, there is a bill um, which is the subject of extensive uh, discussion and negotiation that seeks to change the um, employment laws in Rhode Island from equal work for equal pay to, or excuse me, equal pay for equal work to equal pay for comparable work. And trying to build into a statute the definition of comparability is a real uh, difficult challenge and one that has been uh, the subject of a lot of discussion. Where that one will play out, um, I don't know. Um, but it's once again a bill that uses, in, in our mind, um, misleading statistics that aren't correlated to um, actual workplace um, world rules. And unfortunately, um, it's being pushed uh, by parties outside Rhode Island because they want to continue to gain footholds for that particular concept in state legislation around the country. So with that, uh, I will uh, end. And uh, once again, I, if, if I can hang on, I'll wait around for questions, but uh, I may disappear. Jim, thanks so much for that update. Do you wanna quickly flash your photo so everyone can see what you look like in case they join late? I'm you know you see them around. Oh. I'm, I'm a little green, but hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. I just want people to put a name to a face. I mean, it's Rhode Island. Probably everyone knows who you are anyway, but if not, now if they run into you someplace, they'll go, that was that excellent attorney I heard speak. Well, thank you, Monica. Okay. Um, so Jim and David, thank you both for that government affairs, up, uh, government affairs update. And I don't know about the rest of you who are listening, but I am very relieved that we have them working behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the scenes to do this important work for us. Is there, how many bills are there usually to track? A couple thousand, I think? We, yeah, yeah, we look at we look at over um, probably about seventeen hundred. There there are a few of them we can reject out of hand, but um, and then it's several hundred that we follow, um, uh, and we Rimba at least has forty two that we are opposed to, and seventeen that are strongly opposed. Um, some of them all fall in, you know, there, there, there may be five of them that would fall into one bucket, and, but it's, it's a challenge. And uh, Ryar and uh, Rimber are fortunate because the outside lobbyists that we use are the same. It's uh, Terry Martesian and uh, Lynette Forey Menard, and uh, they do a great job for us. Well, thanks for giving them a shout out too. So we appreciate all of their efforts. At this point, um, 
I would like to turn things over to Al Grant. And Al, as you introduce, reintroduced Rhonda and Jane, feel free to mention what, what lender you're, or which, which company that you're with and what your role is there. You're very welcome to do that. So Al, we're going back to the president of RIMBA. And Al, in your other life, you are with Washington Trust, right? So, oh, I think you, I got to unmute you, Al, I think. And then we'll be ready to let's see if I can do it. Okay, there you go. Unmuted. All right. Yes, yes. I'm a, I am with the Washington Trust Company, a senior vice president on the mortgage origination side of things. <clears throat> Thank you for that. And uh, I just thought I'd just jump in for a minute before I uh, bring Jane and Rhonda into the into the mix. Um, number one, just as as we head into a summer that looks a lot more normal and hopeful than the last. I think as RIAR and RIMBA members, we should take a minute and give ourselves a pat in the back for how we all have weathered the past year. I mean, thankfully our memories are short, but we went from shutting down open houses, town halls, working nervously under a blanket with a flashlight to navigating through to one of our best years in, our, in both our industries. So cheers, well done. Uh, in assessing where we are today, one of my best go-tos for local data has always been RIAR. You guys are fantastic at disseminating meaningful, timely information. So I'll just repeat a couple of quick stats that you've provided me, but RIAR is reporting uh, April's median sales price rising 18% to a record $349,000. Uh, a 1.2 month Rhode Island inventory with 35 days on the market. I mean, just crazy numbers. Um, US figures for median sales price, annual price appreciation and days on the market are all at record levels also. Um, that's, there's good news and bad news with that. And, and uh, I think, RIAR, David, and Leanne appropriately have been calling for legislative and regulatory help in adding to the housing stock because uh, I think we're all wondering how this all plays out. It really is a puzzle. Uh, you know, the, we're, we're, we're happy for uh, the, the, the sales that we've had. Uh, price appreciation is a good thing, but how does this all end? You know, we can't continue to have 18% uh, increases and, and things of that nature. So it's, it will be interesting. And I'm glad that as, uh, as two important groups in this, in this puzzle that we're, that we're all talking together. Um, if I may, regarding interest rates, this is obviously a question we get a lot. And I thought I might just take a minute and give a quick mortgage economics lesson. Um, won't answer where interest rates are necessarily going. Uh, if I could do that, I, I wouldn't be on this call. I'd be on an island somewhere. But uh, the Federal Reserve, AKA the Fed, is often a source of confusion for consumers when it comes to mortgage rates. The evening news says things like the Fed kept rates unchanged and people assume it has something to do with mortgage rates. The Fed funds rate, the thing the Fed actually decides to hike, cut, or hold steady, has almost nothing to do with the mortgage market. Mortgage rates are infinitely more concerned with the Fed's bond buying policies. Movement in the bond market is the foundation of day-to-day -day mortgage rate changes. Bonds can move for a variety of reasons, but the most reliable and most basic reason is supply and demand. By acting as a massive buyer of bonds, including the bonds that directly underlie mortgages, the Fed increases demand relative to supply. So higher demand means higher bond prices and higher bond prices equate to lower rates, all other things being equal. In other words, Fed bond buying equals lower rates and they've been buying more than anyone for a long time. Ideally, the Fed won't need to do this forever but change is scary when it refers to the Fed withdrawing support. It was this sort of change for those of you who are around that sparked the temper tantrum, the taper tantrum, excuse me, 
in 2013, which accounted for some of the most abrupt rate spikes in decades. Markets are understandably cautious about a repeat performance and market participants thought they saw hints about tapering in the recent Fed meeting minutes. How does this all translate? Well, the, the reality is the Fed isn't even talking about tapering yet. There are just four Fed members who agree they should talk about it in the future if certain things happen. Pretty, pretty logical, actually. The market reaction ended up being logical as well. So a little spooked at first, but quickly calming down. So I think in the on the short term, uh, we're not we're not anticipating wild swings in 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 current interest rates, and current interest rates remain extremely competitive. Uh, as an aside, I would I would tell my RIAR friends keep an eye on recent disruption to conventional financing of investment properties and second homes. Uh, our regulators, the FHFA, and as follows, the agencies, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, have once again hit our industry with some poorly thought out, entirely unmanageable restrictions in our business that ultimately hurts consumers. This time it's focused on conforming loan volume caps pertaining to second home and investment property financing. It can impact rates and pricing for these borrowers, so make sure your borrowers are properly prepared. And uh, any of us on this call from RIMBA can, can speak to you individually if you have questions about this, but it's just something for us all to keep an eye on. I thought also we'd talk a little bit about uh, what I refer to as COVID hangover in our business. Uh, as we've learned, it's a lot easier to implement emergency orders, regulations, and guidelines than it is to remove them. Here's a snapshot of a few of the temporary COVID orders from Fannie and Freddie that we are, and in due course, you and your buyers are still contending with as we come out of this pandemic. Uh, easy one for us, you've probably all dealt with it a little bit, but when dealing with self-employed borrowers, uh, we now need very current profit and loss statements and bank and business bank statements. For all borrowers that are self-employed, we need a profit and loss statement dated within 30 days of an application date. The statement must also be no older than 30 days of the note date. This means if you had a purchase, if you had a purchase that applied today with a closing of July 31st, they'd need a profit and loss statement covering at least through May 31st. They would also need to provide three months business bank statements that cover the date of the PL, so that we would need March, April, May. Where this can be problematic for purchases is often borrowers will provide documents for a pre approval in advance of their application. When we ask them for updated info, the client can feel as they need to redo everything. Uh, it can also cause issues with qualifying if a borrower runs a more seasonal business with ebbs and flows. So with, and we'll talk a little bit more about this with Rhonda and Jane, but really, you know, when we're, when you're dealing with a, a buyer who is self-employed, just be aware. It's, it's really about good communication with your lender. Uh, uh, it's our job with borrowers to set proper expectations for documentation requirements and some of the, just the realities that we have to live with today. May not be forever, but today. Uh, also with self-employed borrowers, we still need to verify the business is open. You know, and again, if you think back to this time last year, that was a real reality. We had to call and, and figure out if a business still existed. Uh, our processors can call and verify with someone at the business if they are open. If not, they need to find a website showing that they can schedule current appointments or ask the client for receipts or invoices dated within 20 days. This is where this is kind of a relic at this point because most businesses are either open or shuttered for good. So from a client perspective, it can feel like an extra step that they may not be used to. Um, general income stability. 
for clients who are self-employed or who rely on commissions or other types of variable income that may have been hurt in 2020 by COVID, we can see income numbers reduced by this impact. The agencies, Fannie and Freddie, Ginny May, do not allow us to remove a snippet of time from the calculation. So a pure commission person, for example, who had five unpaid months due to COVID, but is now back to pre-COVID levels, needs to have their entire income over a 24 month period averaged in. We can't exclude the unpaid period. This is also true for self-employed people with one-time COVID loss. We must still income average. Then there's the age of documentation, which I'm sure you've all dealt with. Uh, a, uh, the agencies require all qualifying documents besides the credit report, so pay stubs, bank and asset statements, P&Ls, et cetera, to be dated within 60 days of closing. Typically, that was 120 days. Um, so on a purchase, this affects people who pre-qualify early. They do their job uh, and, and get the pre-qualification through a qualified lender. But just based on timing, we may be back asking that client for updated documentation that just a year ago we didn't have to do. Some of that uh, in a related matter, liquidation of funds. Since COVID, the agencies have required that if borrowers are liquidating funds from an investment or retirement account, we must see a full paper trail of the money coming out and that money going into a checking or savings account. They only allow us to use 60, 60 to 70% of the account value if those funds are being used to qualify as reserves. And that reason is market fluctuation. And, and there were some wild market fluctuations last year, as we all recall. Uh, where this can be problematic on purchases is sometimes investment accounts are hard to document transfers out of. It's also something new for repeat home buyers with lots of assets who've never had the uh, never had to been asked this before. And just another, an, another area, sometimes this has more to do with refis, but it can be very problematic on a purchase if we don't pay attention, and that's forbearance. Um, the agencies require that any loan, even on a home being sold or rented, that is or has been in forbearance, be current in the month prior to note date of the new loan they are making. What this means that if a buyer has a home they are selling and they put that mortgage in forbearance with the plan to pay it back when they sell, they will need to make that mortgage current in the month prior to the purchase of their new home. So it's just something that you you could have a you could have a buyer that is following all the rules, went into forbearance for all the right reasons, and mistakenly thinking that they can just get that paid off. Uh, as they as and use those proceeds going into the new home uh, we we want to be ahead of that issue and talking about it ahead of time so they're in the uh, they're in a good situation as they head towards the closing of the new property um, my hair hurts talking about all this stuff so i'm going to shift gears turn it over to our two esteemed guests Jane Furlong and Rhonda Mulligan. I invited them here today because they are both industry veterans who've always approached their work as a true profession. To demonstrate that, they both, well into their established careers, pursued and were awarded the Certified Mortgage Professional des designation. They really are great representatives of RIMBA. As Jane and Rhonda field some questions this morning, please keep in mind they are speaking from an industry standpoint and not always able to drill down on the specifics of a particular situa situation. So Jane, Rhonda, Monica, take it away. Thank you. Jane, would you, would Rhonda and you like to say which, com which um, company you're with? Sure, I'm with Atlantic Home Loans. I've been here for five years and I'm the Rhode Island Operations and Sales Manager. Excellent. And Rhonda, do you want to mention yours as well? 
Sure. Um, I'm Rhonda Mulligan, and I'm a senior mortgage advisor with Province Mortgage Associates. Excellent. So I sent before we, um, I just thought if you like everyone who's on the panel today, you might, who knows, you might be in the market for a new mortgage broker. You never know. Anyway, <laughs> um, we're going to be nice to our guests today. Anyway. <laughs> So um, I get a lot of questions that I kind of actually sent over to Rhonda and Jane and Al. And so these are things I know that I hear from Realtors. They have their own questions that they've heard from Realtors. So would, however you would like to go at this point, um, feel free to just address some of those, those questions that you have on your list. Okay, I can start. I, um, the first question that I was asked was, what is the best practices for the issuance of commitment letters? So as you all know, back in October, the purchase and sale agreement was changed to reflect the TRID confidentiality requirements. So we're not allowed to give out personal uh, non-public information to others. And when we issue commitment letters, a lot of times there'll be something on there that relates to maybe credit or uh, income that the seller and even the agents really shouldn't see. So what we've done is we have um, stopped issuing commitment letters to realtors and we're giving them to the buyer. If the buyer chooses to pass them along, that's fine. Um, that's up to them. Uh, but we are um, giving them directly to the, the buyers. Now, what I've discovered lately is that agents are confused. Do we have commitment? Don't we have commitment? What, you know, what's going on? So what I've started to do is just basically email, uh, just a quick email saying we have commitment, we are all set, and you know, maybe we're on track on to, to the closing date, but that's how we're handling it. And I think that's the uh, probably the best practice for that. Excellent. Do you want to take turns answering questions? Sure. Sure. However you, however you two want to do it, Rhonda and Jane. We have our schedule here of our questions. <laughs> oh, okay, well, you proceed with however you two want to handle it. Sure. Um, my question was, should you consult with your mortgage professional prior to finalizing dates on the purchase and sale? Absolutely. As mortgage professionals, we understand how quickly the market's moving right now and how many bids are going in on a property and how anxious people are. Um, I would say, you know, as a realtor and a mortgage professional, we all have to work together to make sure that it's a um, successful transaction. So you should absolutely consult with the mortgage person in regards to dates. And here's why. We know the customer's profile. We know what's going on in regards to how long appraisals are taking. You know, the market's very, very busy now. And typically when we trend into the late spring, summer, that's our busiest time of year. So we will know the program, we will know the client's profile, we can work together with you to give a realistic um, commitment date, as well as to make sure we can meet that closing date. And in some cases, realtors will say, hey, we'll get this in and no problem, I'll prep everybody that we may need an extension, you know, depending on the time frame. but we wanna have everybody on the same page. Um, so that, that's very, very important. Um, in regards to appraisals right now, you know, I'm seeing it takes uh, an appraiser two to three days to accept an offer, and then you got to anticipate at least a couple weeks, two to three weeks from when they come out or set the appointment to us getting it back. So that's very, very important. And um, we don't like to issue commitments without an appraisal back and signed off on. So Again, another reason why. So, Brenda, let me let me ask a quick question um, relates to this. So, I've been I've had some closing attorneys who just begged me to tell our members, our realtors, don't count on a four week closing unless someone's paying cash. Then it could be sooner than that. Are you seeing just generally in? Are you seeing more like you know four to six weeks? Does it really depend lender to lender? I think it depends on the lender. It depends on the client. It, it depends on how clean or um, how complicated a file is. So if it's a conventional buyer where we already have all their stuff up front and we're ready to go, four weeks could be realistic. But, you know, if you want to give it plenty of time, 
five to six weeks. Um, and again, I, I think it's that the market's moving so quickly and realtors are trying to present uh, the best offer that they can and everyone wants a quick closing, but that's not always reality. So again, Wait, thank it depends you. on the, the profile of the client, but I'm seeing as appraisals get ordered, they're taking longer and longer lately. Yeah, those are great tips, both of you. Okay, I Jane, agree. I guess we're back to you again. Yes. So the next question or the next uh, topic is, why is it important to have the appraisal language in the additional provision section of the contract? So as Rhonda mentioned, we don't like to give commitments without the appraisal being reviewed by an underwriter and signed off on. And very often what you don't realize is it's not just about the value. It's also about the underwriter signing off on the appraisal because perhaps there are repair items or they see peeling paint uh, in a photo that wasn't addressed in the actual appraisal. And for example, on FHA or VA, that could be an issue if it's extensive, well, it could be an issue even on conventional if it's extensive. Um, so what we like to see in the um, additional provisions is the clause that says, and I like to use subject to property appraising at or above purchase price and subject to lender approval of the appraisal report. That covers the buyer and it also allows us to issue a commitment if we don't have the appraisal in. If it's under the additional provisions, we don't automatically giving the commitment, say the buyer is responsible for any and all conditions of the appraisal contingencies. I mean, the uh, mortgage contingency section. So that's why we like to do that. Great. Rhonda, I think we're back to you. All right, we're back to me. It's like a tennis match. And back and <laughs> forth, everybody, so. <laughs> If a buyer agrees, can you pay your buyer's agent directly? And can that be financed? I'm gonna break that question down because I'm, I'm seeing this come up this year for the first time ever where I'm seeing it in a contract that the client has to pay um, a certain percentage of the buyer's agent's fee. So again, it, it's coming up here and there. Um, could they pay that fee? Absolutely but it has to come from the client's funds. It cannot be financed. So I wanna make that clear again. <laughs> um, that fee to pay a buyer's agent directly, if you're gonna build it into the contract, cannot be financed. It has to be paid by the buyer directly out of their own funds. So you can list it on the contract, but the buyer has to have those funds, okay? So, so that's very important. And again, we're seeing that come up more and more. And in a, in a little bit, I'll get into what allowable um, credits are for a transaction. But people are thinking, hey, you know, I'm gonna build in a buyer's fee of half a percent because I'm only getting two on this one. And I'll just up their, their seller concession. So you, you cannot do that. The buyer has to pay those fees directly. Thanks, Rhonda. And, and one trend that um, maybe a mini trend that we've started to see within the Realtor Association is some listing, bro um, a listing broker or a couple listing brokers saying, you know what, we're going to charge 0% to the seller and then the buyer is paying everything. So that's what we got a flurry of phone calls about that earlier this year. Um, I haven't seen so many now, but yeah, I think what you just said about paying a, a cooperating broker, paying the buyer's agent, I think that that's something that will become could become more of a trend um, at the at the national level within the Realtor Association. We're watching a number of antitrust lawsuits, and, and those have to do with with different aspects of compensation. Some for the buyer, some for the total compensation that's paid. So we may see more of that in the future. So I don't know if it's anything that on the federal level we might see any change in those lending standards, but I can see that continuing. So thanks for mentioning that one. Hey, Jane, the next question up. Sure. The next question up is what's the proper use of the personal property addendum? So when we get contracts, we very often see all kinds of things that are listed conveying with the property. For example, a chicken coop, um, pool equipment, um, you know, the wood stove that's in the garage that's not really connected to the property. Um, I've had all kinds of crazy things come up. And so 
those things become an issue. Even solar uh, panels and, and things like that are now a hot topic. Um, but what happens with those is we are, in most cases, looking at them, figuring out what a value would be, and taking that off the purchase price, which, of course, the seller is never going to like. That's not going to happen. With Rhode Island Housing, for example, I had one that had a chicken coop and it had a pop-up um, carport. And they would not allow us to revise the contract to remove those items. And they wanted something in writing showing what the value of those items were so they could take that off the purchase price. My buyer scoured for probably the better part of a week on eBay and Craigslist and finally found something that showed those items as zero value. And so she printed those off and we were able to show Rhode Island Housing that we didn't have to do anything with that. It was a zero value, but they will not allow a sales contract to be revised where if you did a, a VA or an FHA or even a conventional loan in house, we could revise that contract and just say, could you please revise this and remove um, that it's not allowable. So what happens is um, in 2018, I believe it was Dean Tonicourt, uh prepared or got uh, put in the system a personal property addendum. And that's where all of these items should go. So if you do want to have the, the custom draperies convey and you want to have the you know chicken coop convey or whatever else it may be, that is not part of the normal home. Uh, when I say that, I mean appliances are normal. Those are fine. Um, but if it's something like a um, beer brewing station or whatever they do for that, uh, those types of things cannot go on the normal contract. They really should be put on the personal property addendum. They're considered personal property. They are not considered anything to do with the, the uh, purchase of the home. And so that's why it should be kept separate. Great. These are all these burning questions that you want to ask a mortgage broker, but we're afraid, afraid to ask. So it's nice right? to hear the answers with <laughs> such confidence. So yeah, that is when people have asked, been asking for ages about just, you know, what, what, why can't we just put it in the purchase and sales agreement, all of that. So excellent tip. And I see that on a consistent basis. I even had one last week where the buyer was getting a $7,000 credit at closing and whatever was extra, whatever they didn't use was going to be applied towards the sewer assessment. Well, no, that doesn't work that way. That had to be, you know, I had to call and revise. And, and it, it, it does sometimes amaze me how um, I get pushback. <laughs> I guess it's the best way to say it. I get pushback. They don't want to revise the contract because they think that's perfectly acceptable, but it won't be in terms of uh, lending. Yeah, those are some, I can see, Al, I know that you wanted us to collaborate. I can see a feature in our newsletter, the Rhode Island Association of Realtors newsletter Ooh. about having a mortgage tip like this a month because mm -hmm. we're just great idea. Because those are really questions that I'm always telling people, ask your lender, ask your lender. They don't all do things exactly the same way. Check those things out. So it's nice to hear, hear that with just, yeah, don't do it. Keep it out of the purchase and sales agreement. It's not just us telling you that. It's a qualified mortgage professional. It's like repair addendum too. That's the same thing. We don't need to see the repair addendum. If you negotiate a credit, it has mm -hmm. to be, um, you know, well, I'll let Rhonda get into that. <laughs> okay. All right. Good segue. Back to Rhonda. All right. So we're <laughs> going to segue into credits and what, what is allowable and what is not. So again, I'm speaking from a lending standpoint. When you are getting a credit, it has to be um, a seller credit towards closing costs and prepaid items. And I'll get into what those are in a minute for those that it's not clear, but um, you know, we don't wanna see on there, oh, $5,000 seller credit towards the repair of the roof or anything, septic. It has to be worded <laughs> as a seller credit towards closing costs and prepaid items, okay? And let me get into what that is because I still see contracts come over sometimes from seasoned folks that will mention a credit towards repairs and, and that is not allowable in our world. So in regards to, and these are the agency guidelines, um, which is, you know, Fannie Mae guidelines of what is allowable for um, a financing concession. So financing concessions will typically include origination fees, discount points, commitment fees, appraisal costs, 
transfer taxes, attorney fees, survey charges. So all the, the nuts and bolts of a closing, okay? Um, the prepaid items are interest charges, real estate taxes. Um, you know, when, when we close on a purchase, we have to collect one year of homeowner's insurance. So that can be included in regards to that. Um, initial or renewal of mortgage insurance premiums, escrow accruals. Um, I'll get into that in, in one second. So now, as long as you know that you can't do a seller credit towards anything to do with fixing the property, we don't want to see it worded that way. Um, in our world, in regards to conventional and government financing, you can get seller credits. We're not seeing them as much as we used to because of this market and uh, sellers can cherry pick the buyers. But in regards to when you ask for a seller concession, it's important that you know what type of program the buyer's getting because there's certain percentages they can only go up to, okay? So for example, on a conventional loan um, with 5% down and less, they can get up to a 3% concession um, FHA, they can get up to 6%, VA is even more, but you want to consult with the mortgage professional and see what's needed because whatever doesn't get used of that concession, the, the buyer will lose it. So as Jane said, they wanted to say, oh, well, whatever doesn't get used will go towards the sewer assessment or what have you. That cannot happen, okay? So you want to give them a realistic seller credit that'll be used towards uh, seller concessions and, and prepaid items, you know, the prepaid items and closing costs rather. But if, you know, sometimes I'll see a contract come through with $10,000 in, in, you know, seller credits and it's like, whoa, I'll have to have a conversation with the agent. Like they're not going to use all of that or they don't need all of that and we don't want them to lose it. So that's sometimes where you'll split some of the difference and come down on the price of the house a little bit and give a more realistic um, seller credit. So I hope that clarifies and I didn't confuse anybody, but if you have any questions, you can just let me know. I wasn't planning to jump in with questions, but I guess I've been doing it as follow-ups. I hope you two don't mind being put on the spot like this, but, um, but what, what you just said, Rhonda, reminded me, actually what both of you just said, um, reminded me that sometimes we've seen some contracts where there's a lump sum, let's say 5,000, let's say $10,000 um, sent for seller concessions and the extra would go to pay for commissions. So I think I've heard you both say, no, you cannot do that. No. no. Okay. Thanks for clearing that up. Nope. Okay, the next question or the next uh, uh, topic to talk about is don't always judge a book by its cover. What I mean by that is I get many, many conversations with realtors calls from listing agents um, asking me about my buyer's qualifications. They've, issued, they've received my commitment letter. I'm, I'm sorry, my pre-approval letter. And, um, you know, they asked me about uh, the financing. So it's a misnomer that no money down, for example, on a VA loan is um, a more risky loan than a conventional loan with 20% down. Lots of realtors may advise their sellers that, you know, the 20% down is going to be a better deal and uh, better financing. And that's not always the case. VA, for example, zero percent down or no money down is a benefit to the veteran. That is for them serving our country, they, they get this benefit and they use it. And very often they do have money to work with. They just choose not to use it because they wanna take advantage of their benefit. I had someone about a year and a half ago who was getting over $150,000 in proceeds from the sale of his house. And he put no money down on the next house and used his VA benefit. Now, um, you know, veterans or FHA or even Rhode Island housing loans, don't make them low credit, barely qualifying deals every time. So yes, you do have those that are pushed to the limits a little bit occasionally, but that, that's not necessarily um, the bulk of the loans. I'm seeing, especially with Rhode Island Housing, people are, are just wanting that $10,000 down payment assistance. To get that, you have to have a 660 or better credit score, and you do have some income limits, but, but they are for the more qualified people. They're not for the people who are, you know, 580 credit scores and they're barely making it. So, you know, when you're looking at all of the offers that you receive and you're trying to weed out who's 
good and who's not, or what's the better uh, choice for your seller. Um, don't always look at it as no money or little money down is definitely the one you throw away because sometimes they are the better buyers. Al, did you want to jump in? Did you have anything you wanted to add? I see your screen light up sometimes. So I didn't know if there's anything you wanted to jump in as follow-ups. No, no, but I mean, this is what, that's why I brought the experts in. Uh, these two are fantastic. <clears throat> and then I thought, you know, possibly we could just, uh, everybody's favorite topic these days, um, just talk a little bit about, uh, and I'll, I'll pull Jane and Rhonda back into this, but uh, Jane and Rhonda, you hear anything about, problems with appraisals and, and values coming in these days? That's never an issue, is it? <laughs> they are starting to uh, pop up every now and then that, that we're seeing low appraisals. Uh, yeah. Some amaze me that they come in uh, considering, you know, the, the, the jump in value, but, but they mm -hmm. are um, case by case, we are seeing a few low ones. So what, what, uh, you know, and 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 it's going to happen in a market where I mean, we're everyone's dealing with it now. You you see a property get listed, and and the next thing you know, it's sold for sixty thousand dollars more than the list price, and suddenly mm -hmm. the appraisers, you know, public enemy number one because you know he didn't hit that number. Um, right. But when there is a legitimate dispute, what? I guess, number one, what is a legitimate dispute and what can be done uh, for for agents? What can they do to help with that, you know, to 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 get that dispute resolved? Want me to jump in on that first? James? Sure. So I just want to explain for those of you who have not seen an appraisal report is it, it is an extensive report. And I think you understand first what we look at. So when the appraisal comes in, I'll always go through the report, you know, just check the subject property and I'll look at the comps, I'll look at the dates that they sold, I'll look at what they sold for, the appraiser will list uh, like a listing or so, you know, um, and the description of the property, okay? So as mortgage professionals, we haven't gone out to that property, <laughs> we haven't seen it, we've seen the MLS sheet, but you guys are the value experts, okay? So when I look at an appraisal, I kind of gear, was this person on the money or not? You know, is he comparing it to similar, he or she comparing it to similar houses? You know, it's a, if it's a cape, you're going to compare it to a cape. If it's a house that's 100 years old, you cannot compare that to new construction. So let me, let me start with that, is we're going to look through it first. Um, it is more and more prevalent that there are under appraisals coming through. Um, and the first thing, you know, we'll normally do is I will reach out to the buyer's agent and discuss the appraisal. I'll provide them with the comps that the appraiser used. And um, there is a dispute process that we do as lenders, but it's based on the information that we get from you folks. And again, you're the, you're the value experts and you're the ones going out to the house and having a feel for the market. So when I provide the comps, I'll always say, provide us with a similar property that the appraiser has not used, and please read the comps that they used. You cannot cherry pick across town in a better neighborhood, or I've had agents provide a much bigger square footage of a house. <laughs> we, we can't use that. So I'm gonna stress that it has to be a similar property um, sold within three to six months. If it's a unique property, I've seen appraisers go out to a year, okay? And um, in regards to, we can, again, submit a reconsideration of value report, but we're going to ask you guys to provide similar information. Now, how do you get ahead of it? Um, you know, if you have, if you're the listing agent on a property, the appraiser is always going to call you directly. And I would strongly suggest if you have any question on that value, you provide comps to that appraiser of how you support that value, okay? Because an appraisal is, is an individual's opinion of a property. But if you, if you give them strong data and say how you, how you priced it out, um, it's gonna be very, very helpful because we know right now people are going in so far over asking price, but we wanna you know, prep sellers and buyers alike 
that that appraisal has to come in so that everyone's realistic and working together in case it doesn't. So again, when we do a reconsideration of value, we will review the comps that you provide to make sure that they're comparable. And the underwriters, and a lot of agents don't understand this, they have their back-end systems and there's reports that come with the appraisal that will flag that property if it's believed that Fannie or Freddie recognizes it as excessive value. So that's one of the first things I look at when I open an appraisal report is that report of what is the ranking of that property in regards to its risk. So, and that's why sometimes we'll come back to you and say, hey, the property appraised, but we need a desk review. And that's because that property is being flagged. So I hope that clarified some information, Jane, I'm sure you can chime in. I think that was perfect. Exactly, exactly what we're looking at. Correct. Right. And, and you know the important thing uh, also is we, uh, you know, based on what we went through in the Great Recession, uh, we are, as lenders are extremely regulated in this regard. You know, we we can't call up an appraiser and say, uh, "Here's what you need to do," and. Even we cannot just say, you know what, uh, we don't love this appraisal, so the buyer is willing to pay for an entirely new appraisal. We can't mm -hmm. even do that. We we have to show that there's there's significant uh, errors in in the appraisal that was done before we could even consider something along those lines. Um, because as soon as we're deemed appraisal shopping, so to speak, you know, let's slow, let's get another one. And, and maybe that'll bring in the number that we want. We're, we're at significant risk with, with our own regulators. And, and, and the truth is uh, rightly so. Um, and I would say, you know, look, we, as we've noted throughout this conversation, uh, we're in uh, uncharted waters right now as far as, you know, this marketplace and, and, and values going up. So some of the arguments, which I completely understand is, look, I mean, you know, the, the marketplace is paying for this, you know, is, is paying this number. So doesn't that set the value? Well, in an escalating value environment, uh, we have to be aware of that. But that's a two-way street. Sometimes you know, the market's going the other way. And I don't get a lot of phone calls saying, hey, wait a minute, the market's going <laughs> down, so you need to drop that price. Right. So it's it's touchy and and I and and I feel for the appraisers in, in, in this situation. So I think, you know, Rhonda and Jane hit it right on the head. I think and, and really it goes to this entire conversation, but but communication is key. You know, when we're going in way over ask. Uh, on a property, and it could be an issue. Look, that's that's good communication between agent and lender. That's good communication between the lender and the borrower to understand if this doesn't happen, well, here's plans B and plan C. And I think that's just good preparation for people, you know, as, as you go into a, a, a what can be a very tricky situation. The reality is, uh, all that having been said, it's really, you know, we've, with, with agents help, uh, we've been able to navigate through this, you know, as lenders. And, and I think that starts with just people understanding the ground rules and, 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 and understanding exactly what we're heading into in, in each transaction. So, um, uh, I, I, I feel the pain sometimes on the appraisals, but I hope you understand a little bit about, you know, where we're coming from and where you can help us. And, and Rhonda was right on it with, you know, excellent comps up front um, is, is nothing but good ammunition for getting, you know, good information into an appraisal report. Yeah, so easy to have it up front versus trying to fight it later. Mm-hmm. And we are getting, we do have several questions in the Q&A, but I want to make sure that Rhonda and Jane, that you have a chance to go through everything that you were mentioning or uh, all the questions that you had. I'm not sure if you had a chance to hit everything you planned to or. We did. We did. Yes. Oh, perfect then. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question as the moderator's prerogative before we move on to the Q&A. 
And just as a reminder to everyone, our program will end at 11, but um, we do wanna make sure we have a chance to get the questions answered. So this was one that actually came up to me late yesterday. Um, I mentioned it informally to Rhonda and Jane this morning. So if the appraisal falls short, you go through all the processes, the appeal process still doesn't work. Um, I know that we're seeing more uh, folks putting in purchase and sales agreements that the buyer will make up some of the difference. Um, now the question with that, so one, how do you see that in general, just about how does that work for you if the buyer making up the difference if the appraisal falls short? And then um, the question specifically was about VA and FHA loans in Rhode Island housing. Or do they allow their borrowers, uh, those kind of loans, can the borrowers make up the difference if they have the money? So yes, you can definitely do that. There is no restrictions for any of the programs to pay the higher amount. Um, we typically ask that they write a letter saying you realize you're paying more than the property is worth so that they are, you know, um, made aware of it with, you know, and it's very um, uh, transparent, you can see it. And then, yes, yeah, so the financing, it would be based on the lower of the purchase price or the appraised value. Mm -hmm. And anything extra to go to the price that they originally agreed upon would be paid outside of the mortgage transaction, basically. I mean, it, it's really not, but it is in, in a way. So in other words, if it, if it appraised at uh, 280 and the property was being sold at 300, the 20,000 would be uh, given at closing directly to you know the settlement statement and additional to the financing that we're doing based on the 280. Perfect, thank you. Okay, let's move to the Q&A. Um, okay, let me take, all right. Um, here's one. How do lenders feel about clients paying above sales price and are lenders denying the loans? I think you kind of covered that with the appraisal, but um, anyway. Yeah, I yeah, think no, it, you know, we it, don't it, see anything. It's, it's, it's uh, again, as long as it's, it's the buyer's prerogative and, and, and as long as everyone understands, because, you know, here, here's something that, that uh, Jane, Rhonda, and I know that uh, you pay 75000 over asking price today. And uh, when and three years from now, when things go bad, you probably be the first person to come back to us and say, you let me <laughs> pay too much money for that property. <laughs> and uh, the so so we don't have an issue is if the if the borrower has the wherewithal, as Jane put perfectly, we're always going to use the lower of the two figures in, in our world to determine, you know, the financing levels that we will, that we will take on, but, but no, they can pay more for it. That's actually a good reminder for realtors too, that um, I think that some of those same borrowers and purchasers might be knocking on some of your doors saying, why did you let me pay that much? Never mind that you gave all kinds of warnings, you know, this is a temporary market, you know, consult mm -hmm. an attorney, consult the mortgage broker, yeah, anyway, people have selective right, memories right. at times, I think, in both in both professions. Um, okay, now, now we have one about um, condos. I don't know, I'll, I'll toss this out there. If you're able to answer it, great, off the top of your head. If you need to think about it, we can follow up with folks later. Um, so the question is this, why can some mortgage companies finance non-warrantable condos and others cannot? Why, why can some mortgage companies finance non-warrantable condos and others cannot. I think it, you know, it's based on the products that the mortgage companies have. Um, some of us that um, we, we don't service our loans or don't have in-house portfolio products, we would have to go through another lender to, to do so. Whereas, uh, you know, some lenders will have portfolio products where they'll handle the non-warrantable condo. So it's all about what the, the mortgage person or the lender has access to. Correct. Not everybody has access to the same programs. And just for anyone listening who is not familiar with the term, anyone wanna take a stab at explaining non-warrantable versus a warrantable condo? It just basically means that they don't follow the Fannie Freddie guidelines. So if it's outside of the normal approval guidelines of Fannie Freddie on condos, it would be considered non-warrantable. 
And it could be things like, for example, a good example is one person owns too many units. So there is a limit or a cap on mm -hmm. how many uh, one person can own in that development. I'm glad I'm the moderator because that would have taken me two paragraphs to answer. So thank you. <laughs> I'm sure our audience appreciates the short answer. So. Okay, um, we've got two more questions here. And then um, actually, I think we're pushing right up at 11. So if anyone needs to go, feel free. Um, I know a few folks would be willing to actually let me thank our panelists before we take these last two in case anyone needs to drop off. So thank you all so much, David, Jim, Leanne, Al, Rhonda, Jane. Thank you all so much. And you as did, I think you did the uh, did RIMBA proud as representatives of it. So I hope we'll be able to collaborate on other discussions. So as a reminder to all, um, the video will be available sometime next early next week um, after Memorial Day, please. And so I did put the link in chat if anyone would like to take a look or maybe something went by too quickly. Do you want to think, ah, I finally got the answer to that question. Yes, I'm going to write it down or listen to it again. Okay, so on that note, let me um, run if you if Brenda and Alan and Jane, if you have a chance, if you wouldn't mind these last two questions. Uh, no, okay. no, I, I just want to say, uh, Monica, number one, thank you very much. Number two, if the, if the last questions are tough ones, I'm going to have to drop off. Um. <laughs> no, bad computer, computer connection. That worked for Jim, right? So, no, just kidding. Okay. No, but it, as I said earlier, the, uh, I, and just I'll, I'll, I'll close it now, but, and then we'll go to the question, but I can't thank Ryar enough for, you know, giving us this opportunity and I just hope that we do a lot more of it. Uh, well, I think we're, we're great partners in the same mission and uh, I look forward to further collaboration. Thank you. Excellent. And you're already getting some thank yous in the, um, in the FAQs. So if you wanna look at your accolades. Okay, so last two questions, promise. Thank you. And thank you for your kind words, Al. Um, all right, so with the paragraph in the closing documents, that ask if there are any additional transactions concerning the property outside of the closing, how would that affect the transaction? I think I know what you mean. It, uh, you're talking about, is there any other basically side deals going on that um, you, you're saying this is the whole deal at the closing table. So repair items, and personal property items, again, are not really part of the contract. So they're not part of the, you know, someone buying that property is really not buying the chicken coop. They're buying the house, the land, and the value based on that, on the contract, is based on the person of the actual real property, not personal property. So, um, you know, if something is being done um, uh, as a repair item, repairing the septic or just getting a credit because there's something about it they don't like and, and they've negotiated a repair credit. Um, again, that's not uh, anything to do in our minds with the actual um, cost or purchase of the property. It's, it's a, it's a um, I don't know how to describe it, but it would be considered something separate and apart because we're appraising and we're doing the property based on the purchase price and the real property and its contents and its land and that kind of thing. Rhonda, Al, what, you know, you have a different take on that? No, I think you're right on. You know, I think that's why the personal property addendum was created because it was created to keep personal property just where it's at, personal. Excellent. Okay, final question. Um, so, sort of a comment slash question that I'm reading here. I realize this is going back to commitment letters. Um, I realize the sensitivity of sharing personal confidential information and the urgency in our market. Do you feel that emailing a commitment letter to a client is beneficial to the transaction considering the buyers are already in turmoil and maybe scrambling to obtain paperwork for the lender? So I think it's going back to what Jane had said. I think it was Jane who said before um, that sometimes what you're doing is just you're not sending the whole commitment that you were suggesting. Um, you might you'd send the commitment letter to the buyer, and then what the buyer does with it after that is up to the buyer. So yeah, well, we require that the buyer sign the commitment letter. They have to accept the commitment by signing it. Mm -hmm. So we send it through our secure portal and ask them to digitally sign it. 
So at that point, if they wanted to give it to someone, um, they could, but I, I think most of them don't even print them. Um, so I, I don't know what happens with them, but, but uh, they are required to sign them, at least Atlantic Home Loans. So it sounds you know, like, kind of, oh, go ahead, Rhonda, sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm looking at, hi, Holly. I'm looking at Holly's question, and I, I think I understand what she's saying. She's saying, oh, the buyer's already flustered, and now you're sending this to them. But in essence, it's their loan. <laughs> they have to meet the terms. And oftentimes, Holly, they'll know exactly what's needed because we've, you know, the staff, of we've walked them through of what's needed. Right. And if it's not signed off on yet, we have to put it on that commitment. So sometimes a commitment will go out and I'll say, hey, you know, you already provided us this. It's just in the underwriting queue and needs to be signed off on. But they have to know um, the conditions of their loan that they have to meet because they're the ones borrowing the money. So that's important. So Absolutely. Like and, and, and I think that speaks to just, <clears throat> you know, good communication again, you know, that that we've got to give, as as Rhonda said, we got to give people the facts. And, and, and if we're communicating properly with a client, they understand the difference between what we would refer to as a lender condition and a borrower condition. And, and, the, and the borrower should know, you know, it, very in plain English, what's needed from them to be able to get this uh, cleared for them to close. So um, if, if, if we're communicating well, right from the beginning, uh, we, we do our best to avoid as much turmoil as we can, Holly, but <laughs> it's, it's, not a, it's not a perfect science though. Well, I think that that now, thank you all for your take on that. I think that that's a good reminder for Realtors if you're representing a buyer in the transaction, you know, stay on top of the buyer because you're already doing that with or should be doing that with deadlines anyway. So if, if you want to ask the buyer, like, hey, have you gotten your commitment letter let, yet? What's going on with it? If you represent the buyer, um, that's something that <clears throat> that's an area where you can take a little bit of control. And even if the buyer is confused, you can say, send it to me. I'll take a look at it. Do you know what I mean? If you want, if you want to take that on, you can certainly. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, as Jane said, the buyer's got to sign it. So and then also, if you're a listing broker, um, if you don't, if you're if you're not working with someone like Jane who's willing to send at least a written confirmation saying yes, there is a commitment letter, even though she's not, even though no one's able to send the whole thing without the buyer's consent, um, still as a listing broker, the Rhode Island Association of Realtors Purchase and Sales Agreements give you the authority from the buyer to contact the lend the uh, lender or mortgage broker to get an update on what's going on. So they're not going to tell you exactly why a loan's been denied or you know, the elements of the commitment because of, as um, I think Rhonda said before, the TRID requirements, but you can at least find out like, hey, are they telling the truth? Do they actually have something here or not? What do I have to tell my seller? So on that note, I know we're a few minutes after. So I just want to thank all of you for tuning in and thank our panelists again. And we'll give you a, I can clap anyway, since I'm not the panelist. So thank you all so much. And thank I hope you for having you have us. a great long weekend. Thank you. Have you a great well. day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye now.